I was taken over in Italy in the spring of, in the late winter of spring of 45. How old were you? Hmm? How old were you? How old was I? Yeah. I was uh, 21. <laughs> After all, <laughs> we were young then. That's why they wanted us. The reason they, I, I happened to get in, well, I'll, that, I'll tell when we get into the story. I'll tell you all about that if you wish. You got Any a picture there? This is my, this is my gra graduating picture. Not graduating. Wow. And I have the models of airplanes we flew. I got one over there. <laughs> it's a bunch of my classmates. Oh, I wonder where oh. I happened to them. Flew, flew funny looking airplanes. <laughs> but I, like I said, I wanted to be a take advance, uh, fly B 25s. I don't know why. That's because Jimmy Doolittle flew them over the first raid on Tokyo. I flew B 25s off an aircraft carrier and bombed uh, Tokyo. That was 42 if that happened. In so he was one of, been my, he, one of my heroes. <laughs> so I thought that's what I wanted to fly. Okay. Okay, well first off I want to know um, how you say your last name. How do you pronounce it? Yes. Well, uh, Leinecke. L-E-I-N-I-C-K-E. Leinecke. Yeah, that's, uh, I thought it was all German, but my boy told me recently that uh, uh, probably my, I was a, a Danish. That the Back in those days when my ancestors came over back in 1842, uh, 52, excuse me, they, uh, Denmark was uh, uh, never, when they formed up Germany, which was in 1870 something like that, uh, into a country, it was all German st uh, states. And Denmark didn't get in, but he said he found out recently it was just live with Lani Kiesel. And my ancestors sailed from uh, Copenhagen, and most of the Germans came from Bremerhaven, through Bremerhaven. Anyway, the Germans used to shoot at me, so I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Mr. Leineke, when were you born? I was born October 10th, 1923. In fact, this past, last birthday was the 10th month, 10th day, 10th year. It occurs once in every 100 years. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I am Cheryl Walker, and I'll be the interviewer, and I work with Illinois State Library. I know. Okay, thank you okay. for coming out. What war and branch of service did you serve in? I served in the United States Army Air Force in the World War II. Okay. And I, uh, Graduated from high school one and a half months approximately after the World War II began. And uh, I was, of course, 18, so I was subject to draft, registered, but uh, they didn't call me. So along about September, somewhere along in September, they, I saw in the paper where they uh, no longer had to be two years of college to get into the Air Force because they wanted to pull in and train 40,000 airmen for pilots and so forth. And uh, so I went up to Peoria and took the metal test and evidently passed it. And I went back then later, took the physical and was sworn in. And then I was called to active service on January 43 and uh, reported to the Army at Decatur. Where, and all these guys from the Sixth Corps area like me were under the same deal. Uh, they shipped us all down to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, which is just south of St. Louis, uh, for our uh, basic training. And uh, they were not ready for us because this was all, we were the first big bunch, of, one of the big bunches to come in. And uh, anyway, we eventually got, they got us settled down and uh, they didn't have much for us to do except we learned our left foot from right foot and did an awful lot of marching day in and <laughs> every day. <laughs> practically. And uh, when we finished basic training, then they, uh, we were shipped up to Stevens Point State Teachers College in Wisconsin. And uh, 
that was where I first got my first airplane ride. They gave us 10 hours of dual instruction in Piper J3 Cubs, which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they were very light aircraft and uh, were not very fast and they were subject to a lot of problems with wind, so you had to always know where the wind was from. And uh, that was very basic flying. We got 10 hours of dual instruction, but they were not allowed to solo. And we, when we finished there, uh, they shipped us out to uh, Santa Ana, California, which is a suburb of L.A. And that was pre-flight, and there we became aviation cadets. They should do uniforms, and uh, uh, we went through uh, extensive psychological and mental tests of all kinds, and a lot of P.E. and physical ed, you know, training, calisthenics, calisthenics and uh, uh, at the end of the time there, we were classified for future training, and I was classified for pilot training, some classified for bombardiers, and some for navigators. I didn't have any trig in high school yet, so that knocked me out for a lot of that, because you had to have trigonometry for that. Anyway, I was classified as a pilot training, and uh, from there we were shipped down to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, which is the Thunderbird Field 2, which is a primary training field. Civilian ran, Army check pilots, and we flew the, that bio, that biplane you see up there as Stearman. That was our primary trainer. And uh, I sold that about my tenth hour, and, uh, and then on my, it was just primary training. And, uh, we finished there, uh, we went to basic, and I was shipped back to California, to uh, uh, Lancaster, California. And it was Polaris Flight Academy, it was, again, it was a civilian flying school with Army check pilots. And uh, there we, they started to sit on teaching us basic instruments, um, instrument flying, and that's the main thing that I remember getting out of the uh, basic. We finished basic. Uh, they asked us if we wanted to go to single engine or twin engine advanced. And since I wanted to fly the B-25, which is a twin engine, I requested twin engine advanced training. And they uh, appeased me by sending me down to Marfa, Texas, which is way down on the cattle boon boonies. <laughs> There's nothing out there except a little, little small town. Marfin Alpine was a close, and uh, we went to advanced training. I flew the Cessna Bobcat, which is this second plane you see there in the middle there. Uh, it's a twin engine, low horsepower aircraft, and uh, you could see three in the back, and pilot and co pilot. And then we traded seats for pilots and co pilot, flew times with both of them, and we did uh, learn night flying and cross country and all the, uh, a lot of things of that nature there, but uh, no aerobatics, because it was not an aerobatic airplane. <laughs> anyway, I graduated then the class of 44B. I got, practically everybody in my class was sent to heavy bombardment as bomber pilots. I was lucky, I wasn't. I was given a 10 day leave to go home and I got back to Springfield and spent the week and I got orders to go out to California to uh, Hanford, California, which is a Lemoore Air Force Base right there and I was I found out on en route that I was that was a basic flying school and it turned out when I got out there they I uh, was assigned to teach basic instruments and one of the funny things is at that time I was a second lieutenant and I had a couple of guys I went to high school with who outranked me come through as my students. <laughs> that was interesting. I, but anyway, uh, primarily what you learned there was basic and was flying an all-metal airplane, bigger engine and uh, low wing and these stood of the biplane. And uh, when they finished there, why, like I said, we were allowed to, uh, the twin engine or single engine, I went on down to, to the uh, Marfa, Texas, and went through all that again. But uh, I take that back. I trained it out there, and then 
I was sent to, down to Williams Field to an aerial gunnery school, which, which later I found out was down in Ajo, A-J-O, uh, Arizona, way down in the corner, down the, way out in the boonies. It was nothing but Mexicans and Indians there, main uh, mining town, copper mining town. And uh, I, they had uh, T-6 airplanes, which was a basic, uh, it was an advanced trainer for fighter pilots, and it had retractable gear up to then. I'd never had a plane with retractable gear. We had six hours of aerial gunnery and ground target shooting. And uh, we finished that. They sent me back to California, to uh, San Bernardino, where I have got my first chance to fly a, a fighter plane. They were what they call the Aero Cobra P-39s. That inline engines, which I'd never flown before, though I'd always had what we call radial engines, big round ones. Now these were inline engines, liquid cooled. And we had tricycle gear, a uh, fold of tricycle gear. I'd never had tricycle gear before. And uh, we got about six hours there and training. Uh, no ground school. I mean, ground school, but then uh, no flight in them, except to, they just took you out and strapped you in the thing, started the engine, and said, Go. You didn't have nobody. You never had a ride in one of them before. You were on your own. <laughs> So I thought, well, if I got it in the air, I had to get the damn thing back on the ground, so I didn't worry about it. But it was no problem at all, because it landed just like any other airplane, and only instead of coming down on the tail, we'd have come down on the nose wheel. And uh, when we finished there, then they sent us up to Northern California, up near uh, San Francisco, to a holding place to wait till our uh, 38 school opened up. And uh, we were there about a month or so, and our school opened up, and I went then to Santa Maria, California, where I took my P-38 training. And uh, you know, we did dive bombing and skip bombing and various things, formation, aerial gunnery. And uh, we got done there. Why? Uh, I mean, this is long now, see. They shipped us up to Hamilton Field, which is over the Golden Gate Bridge north of Frisco. Hamilton Field was the uh, Air Force's staging to ship p personnel either the Pacific or Europe. And our, we went to Europe, so we had a train all the way across the United States to Newport News. And there we got board ship and sailed in a convoy for on ship all board. Uh, about at least three and a half weeks it took us to go from Newport over to so uh, we actually went, went through the Straits of Gibraltar, along North Africa, where I first saw signs of war by wrecked ships and airplanes on the shore. And uh, we went up past the Isle of Capri into the Bay of Naples and landed good old Napoli, Italy. <laughs> and uh, they picked us up there, and uh, Foggia is right across. Italy is shaped like a boot, where the spur is, just inside that spur is where the 15th Air Force was because it was, it was farmland, flat ground, and uh, the field that we'd taken over had been a German fighter field and uh, when the Allies had gone through and took territory. And there I was assigned to the 37th Fighter Squadron, and uh, I flew 45 combat missions, um, escorting B-17 and B-24 bombers, and did dive bombing of railroad bridges and railroad tracks and uh, install car, did a little shooting up on the ground and locomotive and a few things because they were trying to destroy transportation primarily and uh, fuel supplies for the Germans. And at the time I was there, the uh, German Air Force had, as a, uh, as a enemy, had Virtually deceased, uh, the Germans uh, had no way of training new pilots because we were over there in Germany all the time with our fighter planes, and uh, they also were very short of fuel, so they didn't have fuel to f fly them. Much, uh, so, with opposition, there was only two aerial attacks on our bombers made while I was there, and then I wasn't on either particular either flight uh, that day, so. We did, I didn't fly every day. You, they 
we had enough people that they kind of alternated us. The first flight was the worst because I had never uh, been to a mission and uh, it was to dive bomb a railroad bridge over northern Yugoslavia, single track, mind you, which what <laughs> not very big. And uh, our airplanes were not ever designed as dive bombers. We didn't have a bomb site even on them, but you lined up between your two top guns and put the needle in the ball in the center, and that's so you were going exactly straight. And tried your best to release the bomb, and so it would hopefully get to the target, but we were not too successful most times. <laughs> but the uh, reason that was my most exciting, not only that, they warned it would be heavily defended. And uh, that was the first time I was ever shot at, and I seen these orange balls arcing back and forth across me, and I, I thought there were no rocks up here to hide behind. <laughs> you just had to hope they didn't hit you. And, and uh, fortunately, they didn't get me, but the, one of the other guys lost one from one of the other squadrons. But that was my worst experience as far as being shot at. They shot at us a lot of other times, but used it heavy flak guns and so forth. And uh, we had no problem with them. We knew how to get around to handle that. So just changed altitude and direction every 30 seconds or so. And the, the Germans had to cut the shells and fuse them. And so there was time to explode it after so long after they fired them. So they had to cut them so they'd explode about their altitude. And this was detrimental to the bombers because I saw many bombers over Vienna uh, get knocked down because they and the bombers had no choice but once they got on the, yeah, their fi final run for the bomb run, well, they couldn't change altitude or course. So the Germans had fired, they had 350 heavy flak guns there and they just fired up a big barrage and the poor old bombers had to plow through it. We'd go outside and wait for them to come out on the other side. And, and every time you saw one hitting no parachute, you said there goes 10 guys. So Anyway, I was glad I was not a, <laughs> didn't have to be a bomber pilot. Anyway, then uh, towards the latter part of the war, I had 45 missions in, and I was needed five more to finish my tour. But uh, we'd had a whole new group of pilots come over in January, and they wanted to let them fly so they'd have uh, something to tell their grandkids. So I more or less set it out. Uh, I had R and R in Rome for three days and enjoyed that. And I was supposed to go to Alec Capri for three days, but it was so close to the end of the war, they fired, They just phased that out, so I didn't get to go there. But The war ended in May, and uh, they flew me back to, from... I went back over to Naples, and I waited there for till the shipment orders came through, and I, they flew me from uh, Naples to Iran, to Casablanca, where I spent the night. Never got to tour or see anything there. Next morning I was up scheduled for a flight. We flew to the Azores and then we flew down to Bermuda where we spent the night. And Again, I didn't get to see anything. The next day they flew me up to New York. <laughs> anyway, uh, from there I went back to, I had to go back to uh, Chicago there at the uh, fort there. And uh, there they said they no longer, uh, my MOS was 1066, was twin engine fighter pilot. They no longer needed them, they had all they needed, so they gave me the option of getting out or staying in. We were supposed to, if you stayed in, we were scheduled supposedly to go down to Arizona for to jet trainers. They had a start, uh, start transition. We finally had a jet fighter, supposedly, and we were supposed to transition to jets, but uh, I decided to opt, opt out, and so I got out of the service. And what, what year was that? It was 1945. My my time ran out in the uh, middle of July. Hmm. I got married the 30th of June, and <laughs> middle of July I was used up my terminal leave which I had coming, and so I was discharged. Later on, I went back into the active reserves, and they found out that I had a bum ear, which I should never gotten a service in the first place because I'd been 4F. Never told them about, and they stopped. Somehow or other, I got through the physical. The first one, never ever looked at it again, so I didn't say anything, so I flew the whole food. But then I was in the reserves, I made a mistake of saying something about it, and then, you're out. 
That's all I got kicked out again. I got three discharges. <laughs> <laughs> one is a private and one is a, a lieutenant. A lieutenant. And then I was I got to be captain in reserve and I got <laughs> got one for that. <laughs> so Amazing. I was kicked out three times. Well, anyway, that's about it. I did nothing super exciting. I got to see the Alps Mountains a lot. <laughs> and uh, I got to do some very interesting things. I got to do a live. And the first thing I noticed that I made me happy to be flying the P-38s while we first got overseas, they gave us a little training so we'd learn our, learn our local area there and where our field is located and uh, the surrounding territory. and. Uh, they, the meantime, they went down to Salonika, Greece, the squadron did, and, to shoot up some shipping in the harbor there, and they came back, and one of them came back with one engine shot out, and a couple others had big holes in them, and I thought, gee, that guy got back with just one engine, and nice to have two, where you get a single engine fighter, you, if you lose your engine, you're, you're out of luck. So, I was happy to follow the 38. <laughs> anyway, that's... That's all the exciting things I did in the Great World War II. Did you receive any awards, any medals or citations? Oh, I got the usual air medals, no. I got four of them. But that was, if you flew 15 missions, you got an air medal. And you flew 10 more, you got another one. You flew 10 more, you got another one. 10 more, you got another one. 10 more, you got another one, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I didn't. Uh, didn't get any of uh, the super ones, no. <laughs> not towards the end of the war. There was not enough uh, enough aerial fighting going on to get them. In fact, I was glad I didn't get in aerial fighting because those German pilots were left. They, they, the German pilot had no choice but to stay. He either lived through it or he died. So he had no choice because they didn't couldn't train anymore. So somehow uh, the, the the best ones survived. So I'm here to. If I met up with some hot German, I'd put wind up with a signal on the side of his airplane because <laughs> I didn't I didn't really get the aerobatic training because I was went through a twin engine advanced school. Did you share in doing any battle planning? No, I didn't. I was just a just a pilot. <coughs> uh, that's all we did was fly, and they said you this. You go to briefing and you go down there and they'd uh, have a big curtain up on there and they'd pull the curtain back and there there you'd be your route and where you were going that particular day and they told you what you were supposed to do and uh, whether you escorted bombers or you're going to dive bomb or uh, you're going to dive bomb railroad tracks. They were trying to cut trackage and uh, the one interesting thing I did draw, I'd, they had what we call uh, uh, shafts, which was aluminum foil, strips of aluminum foil. And I had two 100-pound bombs under my plane, and uh, they were stuffed with this. And I was supposed to go in ahead of the bombers and uh, drop these, and when these exploded, they blew that foil out, and the foil jammed the enemy's radar, so they couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't take radar picks on the bombers. And then as the rest of the bombers come through, they threw them out for the guys behind them. But uh, that was, an, that was uh, up near where old Romeo and Juliet done romanced <laughs> in northern Italy. But, uh, oh, I had some interesting adventures, but I mean, nothing exciting. I got lost in the air. I was glad I had good instrument training because I was lost in a soup for an hour or so. And, they had to direct me down by radar from a long ways off, and I told them let me down over the Adriatic, and, and they did. I got a, broke out. I was up to 22,000 feet, and when you look down 500 feet a minute, it takes you quite a while to get down. And I broke out of the overcast. I was just over the water and off the coast of Italy, and I did spend the night on the island of Vis, which is off the coast of Yugoslavia, where we had a. Uh, they had a, a field there where they took care of the bombers, the crippled and that coming out of Europe. And then later on, I landed on the uh, mainland of Yugoslavia. 
and spent the night and I got to sleep between sheets and drink good wine and all that good things there or something. <laughs> it was a different life. <laughs> and we also got our first shower in the spring. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. I, I can't imagine to this day how we went all through the winter without showers. <laughs> Couldn't take a shower in Italy. We didn't have showers. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, primitive living. <laughs> oh, well, if you want to see them, I got a picture of my house there and some other things. Oh, it's in so a... you didn't have plenty of supplies. Mm -hmm. You didn't have plenty of food and supplies. Well, and... yeah, but you know, to this day, I don't remember uh, much about the food except we were not given anything that would form gas. Because we were a lot of times, if you get up, get up twenty, thirty thousand feet, why, <laughs> yeah, gas problems. It'd be you'd have some real gas problems. <laughs> but uh, mostly we ate uh, powdered eggs and things like that. And we did manage to get some fresh eggs a few times from the local farmers around here, but that was not too often. The only time I really remember eating, really remember eating spaghetti, was when I was. R and R in Rome, and we were in a big hotel there, and uh, they had big spaghetti dinners, and guys come around playing violins, and I got to go to uh, the Vatican, and I met Pope Pius XII, wow. mm -hmm. and I got to see a lot of things of art, the Pieta, and all those things, and a lot of that stuff I didn't know what the heck I was seeing because I didn't, wasn't even familiar with it. But you know, they say this done was done in 1620 or something by such and such. Okay, who's he? But I don't know. <laughs> but I got to see Rome, and I got to go to the Colosseum, and uh, down in the catacombs, and all those good things. And uh, so that was interesting. I had three days there. <laughs> Sleeping beds with sheets. <laughs> We're used to that. Um, did. I Tell us about staying in touch with your family. Was that difficult? Did you? Uh, no, you could write letters back and forth and uh, uh, the mail as they called it then. Mm -hmm. you know. But uh, we weren't allowed to say anything about where we were or what we were doing or anything. And uh, this was my roommate, yeah, Carl Ergott. He was killed in. Uh, uh, over the Alps Mountains. He, I don't know what happened to him, but anyway, he went on a mission and didn't come back, and they said he'd gone down. Hmm. And uh, he was my roommate. Young fellow, nice kid. Hmm. This is the airplanes we flew. Hmm. B-38s, of course. I'm sitting in the cockpit there. It's not a very good picture, because guy that took the picture. <laughs> Film and things were hard to get over there. So there was only one in... Oh yeah, yeah, you were by yourself. You were a pilot, airplane driver. <laughs> That's when I graduated. I the photograph I took when I graduated from flying school. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh, this is my... Here's a bunch of uh, my buddies. This, This one I told you about that just died, I saw his obituary in there, he was there. And uh, this is our house we built over there. One room. Huh. <laughs> and that's we, what you stayed in? Yeah, that's where I, that was my, I was just, I was built out of knocked down railroad track walls and <laughs> a tent for a roof. <laughs> huh. But, uh, there's my my sack, my cot, and that, and my my fine boots and my helmet, and this is another picture. And here's my other roommate, Lieutenant Diamond. It only snowed one time while I was over there, and uh, yeah, here's the guy that died, just died, uh, my flying buddy. These are some of the other guys uh, over there. I had some other pictures, but I don't know where they went. Some of them have disappeared. <laughs> but anyway, this is my primary flying class. 
That's what we flew the Stearmans. <laughs> and uh, this is where I was taken in Rome from when I was on the tour. And other pictures, most of them. I don't have a lot of pictures. Nobody had cameras or anything. Yeah, here's some of our houses over there. There's the airplane I, I clobbered. <laughs> I came back on my early return. I had a problem and uh, they'd taken up our metal landing strip while I was going to repair it. And they had me land in the dirt and I didn't allow enough airspeed for my... I still had my drop tanks on, uh, which we carried our fuel, extra fuel in. And uh, I dropped in hard. And this was taken when I was... Uh, Here's another one of my, my buddies that I flew with. And this one, this guy here was my instructor, Duffy. And this guy uh, was captain, but I don't remember his name. That's when I were training out San Maria, learning how to fly the stupid things. That's it. Did you have anything that you carried when you flew for special luck, or did you wear something any special way for special no. luck? No. No? No, I didn't carry anything particular. <laughs> we had, uh, we wore a, a May West. You know what a May West is, don't you? No, I don't. No. Well, if you look at that picture here, this thing up here I got on is a May West. It's for if you have to jump and land in the water, you could have a couple little air those aerosol things and you could pop them in to inflate. And then on your back you had a uh, we carried a collapsible dinghy. Uh, so that if we had to go, if we had to come down over, we flew over the water all the time, so the Adriatic Sea, so uh, something happened that you couldn't, you had to come down the water or you could, you could uh, inflate your raft and uh, you need to crawl in it. I have to ask you how it was called, why it was called a May West. I don't know, that's what they call them. <laughs> okay. I didn't name them, all I know is that's what the... the the terminology was, and well, after all, we used to see Mae West in the movies, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, while I was at uh, basic flying school, one sun, Sunday, I was open post. They gave us open post. We'd have a uh, white glove inspection Saturday morning, and then we'd have a parade, and then it'd be open post to the rest of the day, Saturday and uh, and Sunday. And I was out on the base there on uh, Sunday. I hadn't gone into town or anything, and... Uh, Jimmy Durante and uh, Eddie Jackson showed up, and uh, oh, there's oh, probably about 20 of us, 15 or 20 of us there, and uh, they put on about an hour, hour and a half show for us. And he was the only movie star I got to meet, <laughs> Jimmy Durante. But uh, that was one of the highlights of my uh, cadet business. <laughs> got to see Jimmy Durante. Wow, interesting. So, anyway, that's primarily my story of my activities as Uncle Sam. I, but I was in the active reserve afterwards. I was down in Scott Field. I was going to go in. It was going to be a college training detachment. I mean, not a college training detachment, a, a pilot training detachment. And then uh, we went down to uh, Georgia. No, Alabama, I'll get it right to you here, Alabama. And uh, the uh, squadron and the group is down there now, all three of the squadrons. And they, at that time, they were uh, uh, training uh, pilots down there. There's no longer a fighter squadron. And uh, we had a couple of reunions down there with them. Found our amazement they couldn't even sing the Air Force song all the way through. <laughs> but... Anyway, it was a good experience. I lived through it. I'm glad I had a chance to do it. One of the highlights of my life. I love to fly that airplane, but it's been 66 years since I flew one of them. <laughs> I had my own airplane after the war, but 
got too expensive to maintain and fly by myself because my wife was scared of flying and my kids, boys are ready to start college, so it was a luxury I decided I couldn't afford it at the time, so I sold it. <laughs> but I've been in aviation one way or another all my life. Uh, I belong to the Experimental Aircraft Association. We built home builds. And, oh, been good to me. Made a lot of good friends through it. We built several airplanes and flew them. That's about all I can tell you. What um, did you do after you got out of the service? Did you go to school? Did you come back? Well, I went to the University of Illinois a couple of years when I was married, and uh, we got married after I got back. And uh, I got awfully low in funds, so I got a job. I uh, worked Dallas Chalmers for a little, not Dallas, yeah, Alice Chalmers. And then, uh, uh, then I got a job and worked at the state, and I worked there. Uh, 37 and a half years before I retired. And I worked in uh, 25 years in the highway department and the rest of it I worked in uh, the Division of Waterways. And I uh, drew up did drafting work, uh, drew up plans for ditches and roads and all kinds of things related to that type of work. I'm retired. Now I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting pretty old. I beat the, the crawl. I'm 70, 87 now. And that's beat the average age. I see today that the paper, they finally got it up to 78 years now. So I'm just about 10 years ahead of them. <laughs> it's a long time. Anybody from those days that are still alive that you yeah. can put in touch with? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the what? Anybody from those days that you keep in touch with? That's well, alive? yeah, we had reunions every five years, but uh, uh, probably had the last one. I think the last time that uh, nothing lasts forever. As you get old, your friends die and move away, and you know, pretty soon, uh, hey, if I don't find somebody to stay with, I I would go out bowling out. I used to bowl, and I had a problem with my spinal cord, so. That knocked me out, but I still go out to keep company with all of them, and we still have our little airplane group out at the airport, and uh, so I just, so I spend a lot of my, keep my social contacts up. Mm -hmm. For you. I said, like, when you get old, you better value your friends, because you're going to find out they're the best things you ever had. At least that's been my experience. I figure I've been lucky I got to live my life in one of the best eras of our country's history. I hope it gets better, but I'm scared of the future. <laughs> it doesn't look not encouraging. You state employees know all the problems going on. Now you showed us um, this newsletter, right? Lightning Strikes? Yes ma'am. Is that an organization that you belong to? Yeah, it's to? a national organization of uh, uh, P-38 or people who are interested in P-38s. It's full of stories. Uh, I was just reading this one. This one's been a very good issue. It had a story of a lot of these guys that flew the adventures they had. And this one here, he was a, he's in his aviation. Now that's a cadet uniform he's in. And that, uh, and yeah, that's not an officer insignia, that's a cadet insignia. The wings with the propeller. And this guy, he got killed in an accident over in Europe, and uh, his kids hadn't been born yet. And anyway, the kids uh, went back and tracked down where the guy got killed and found out all they could all about it. And there's all kinds of stories in here about various real people and things they did. Oh, I got to meet our uh, ace of aces too while I was in the service, uh, Bong, who. The 38 was the best plane in the Pacific. It shot down more uh, Japanese planes than any other airplane. And uh, Bong was counted, had 40 credited, and they figured he must have shot down at least that many more. But uh, they go in the water and you don't have anybody to verify it, well, you didn't get credit for it. But uh, anyway, he came to our field one day to, when I was in uh, taking my training in uh, Santa Maria. And, 
put on a flight demonstration to show us what could be done with the 38, and it was fantastic, fantastic what that guy could do with an airplane. But anyway, uh, he, unfortunately, he got killed just a short time later, flying a trying to fly a jet. And had a flame out his engine, quit on him on takeoff, and killed him. But Anyway, it's been an exciting life. <laughs> Sounds like it. Sounds like it. So there, you know that. I was trying to think of anything else, but it might be outstanding. Have you ever gone back to any of the places you've no, were stationed at? No, I haven't returned any of them. They did one time. They went back. A bunch of them went back over to to our field, which uh, Fulcher was the basic center for the 15th Air Force, so it's right by the spur. The spur was a little, few little high mountains. They uh, weren't too high, but uh, uh, like I said, this is farmland, flatland. Italy doesn't have a lot of flatland because the Apennines run all the way up in Italy. So uh, Mussolini was very popular down there because he, when he was in there, he built uh, a lot of drainage and things, and the people down there liked him. <laughs> but uh, uh, it <laughs> it was a our field was a, a place called Triola Tech, which evidently is a school, two story building. That our headquarters they confiscated that for our library and our, all the rest of the stuff that the uh, ground smashers or the ground people do, and uh, uh, we built. Build our house, and I got we were in a tent, and I'd one couple of nights in that tent was about all I could stand. And get up in the morning, your clothes are all wet and clam, clammy and cold. <laughs> and this was during that period where you hadn't taken a shower, and yeah, and uh, yeah, in the springtime one day they come out there and they said, "Hey, we got showers. Everybody, anybody wants a shower?" And they'd rigged up a portable shower, and so we all went down and got a shower. Did, I, did the weather get real cold? Uh, in winter time, but not not severe, not like here or anything. Uh, that far down Italy, you you got the Adriatic and the Mediterranean there to temper the. Uh, like I said, we had snow one night there, enough that they had to sweep the snow off the airplane wings and things. And, but uh, no, it it was cold in the winter time, but we always had plenty of warm clothes, no problem. And we had a. We had a house with a stove in it, so we burned the aviation fuel. <laughs> the uh, they were guys. They took these big 55-gallon oil drums and they cut them, made them by about one third of them, and uh, they made gas stoves on. Them. They welded the top in them and that, and we got chimneys on them, and uh, they burned gas in them. I mean, 100 octane fuel. <laughs> yeah, you had to be very careful. If they were warm, you didn't dare light them because they had little kind of circular hollow rings that uh, they are full of gravel, and that's where the, the gas would come in, and then there were those rocks in there, and they'd light it. And uh, got so once in a while, or once if it was a little bit warm, while you'd go to light it and go poof. And <laughs> so the guys next door to us, they were a bunch of clowns. They one of them got a hold of some uh, flares and they cut, to open them up and took the powder out and clumb up on the roof and these guys had their fire going and they dropped them down the chimney and a big puff and all this colored smoke and <laughs> the door fly open these guys all come running out like crazy. <laughs> and, uh, one of them, uh, we had a guy from Maine named Jurassic. He got drunk one night and got his gun out and shot holes over his buddies. <laughs> roof, <laughs> the roof over his bed. <laughs> All kinds of interesting things. He was a, quite a character, Jurassic was. He he played an accordion, and uh, he, but he couldn't read music. But he was he played all the ear. You know, you tell him, hey, how about playing this? Okay, get a squeeze box and go with it. When he got drunk, he could only play one tune. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew he was drunk. <laughs> but anyway, it was interesting. One other time I was, our CO had a real good looking Italian chick that he was running around with and he liked parties so 
he decided he's going to have a big party one night and all of, everybody was invited. So I got called in and it was my job to go out and buy food for this thing. And I couldn't speak Italian. And uh, so he, I got, uh, they gave me an enlisted man who could speak Italian and we toured around buying turkeys and potatoes and things like that, you know, food. And I didn't even know what a kilo was then. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody's talking to kilos and kilos and lira, which is the money. So I let the sergeant do all the talking. <laughs> I just paid the bills. So, <laughs> but I got the job done, but I didn't want to ever do that again. <laughs> but unfortunately for the big party, uh, they used to fly, a, they had a B-25 there that they flew it down to Cairo, Cairo, or whichever you want to call it, Cairo over there, Cairo here. But uh, flew down there to buy liquor, and they come back with a bunch of uh, Cuban gin, and, and uh, they gave us all a chance to buy a bottle of it. And most of us didn't make it to the party because we. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, I can't stand the smell of gin. <laughs> But only other liquor we got was, well, we, we got rations. Uh, I had to go in Fosia once a week to get our rations, and you got so many cans of beer or soda, or uh, you had so many candy bars, you could buy so much cigarettes or c cigars, and it was rationed, I mean, because they had to be all shipped all in, you know. And so I used to go in once a week to that, but uh, that wasn't too exciting. But I come back one day and I had a jeep and I, there was this British soldier standing there and he was dark as he could be. And I saw, well, he's wanting to ride, so I stopped and I was amazed he spoke perfect King's English. <laughs> Turned out he was a South African. <laughs> he could speak English very well, better than I could. <laughs> but every yeah, once in a while you run into funny things like that. But we got uh, every mission you got come back while you got a yeah you were entitled to a shot of whiskey, and uh, we had the option of taking it then or saving it up so that you got something worthwhile. Usually wound up giving it to our crew chiefs because they couldn't get any things like that. So I always took care of my crew chief. Guess so he took care of my airplane, and on him I depended. So <laughs> try to be nice to the guy. But anyway, it was an interesting experience. Well, I have some... Any more questions? I, I don't. I enjoyed listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. There's all kinds of little things that happened over time. And one guy we had was German. Uh, he had ancestors in... Uh, Munich, and we were flying over Munich, I he'd say, I wonder how Grandpa and Grandma are doing. <laughs> yeah, got the lead photo reconnaissance escort one day, this guy, uh, also the P-38s were used as, es as photo reconnaissance and uh, weather planes. Uh, they'd, uh, the weather planes, they'd take off and fly up into deep in Germany and that, and they'd radio back the weather before the missions, so they'd know whether, you know, the weather was good enough that they could run the mission through. We had to abort quite a few of them, but and also the uh, photo, photo boys, they uh, they did, uh, you find them running around up there, they depended on their altitude and speed to, uh, uh, for escape. They didn't even, uh, a lot of them didn't even have any guns on board. They didn't, Ours had, now we had four 50 caliber machine guns and a 20 millimeter cannon all right there in the nose, so we had terrific firepower. And, uh, the biggest bombs I ever carried, I carried two 1,000 pounders at one time, trying to knock out a bridge. And 1,000 pounders look awful heavy hanging under there because two, th two of them that made a ton of bombs, and we didn't have that much wing or very long runway, so I <laughs> always skeptical about getting in the. The 38 was very vulnerable when you 
first took off until you got airspeed 115 mile an hour. And uh, if something happened then, you, you were in serious trouble. So once you got them above 115, why well, you could, you could, you already had enough speed that uh, you brought them in and they'd come in and we'd do what they call a pursuit landing. We'd come across the field about a couple hundred mile an hour and pull up and pull the throttles back. And if you got down to 175, you could drop your landing gear, let your gear down, and that made it dirty and triggered a lot of drag. And then when it got down to 150, you dropped your flaps. Then you had to keep at least 115 mile an hour till you got over, till you were sure of making a runway for you. Chop the throttles. Take it over the fence. Chop the throttles. <laughs> She'd sit down about 85 mile an hour. And then you hoped you stopped before we got to the end of the runway. They were not too long. We only had one runway. But that was fun. Did you always make the runway? Uh, yeah, the only time I told you I wrecked one plane, that mm -hmm. was because I had to land on dirt. Our, our runways were metal st strips with uh, holes in them, perforated holes to let moisture in and out. And with the 38, there were no problem because they were tricycle gear, they were heavy, and you had no what you call torque. An engine rotating a big propeller at high speed tends to pull the nose around. Well, in the 38, they were kind of rotating, so you had no torque. And that tricycle gear, all you do is just head them down the runway, and they're so heavy, and they have to worry about crosswinds. And uh, once you got them up, well, you were fine. Once you got past 115 mile an hour, you're all right. And uh, we'd cruise about normally about 220 indicated. And if you had to get in combat, you had to get above 300. Top speed was just a little over 400. And that was because of this. Of the 38, I said they they were no good at altitude the earlier models because they couldn't dive them. They had compressibility. They had what they call compressible speed of sound, and uh, it killed a lot of test pilots and a lot of pilots because uh, they were no good. At, the earlier ones were no good above 15,000 feet because the Germans could outmaneuver you so easy. But the ones we had, the uh, the last ones they built, Spiders, the J's and the L's, and we had most of the L's. Mine was an L model. Uh, we had a dive brake on them. You could dump that dive brake, and you could do anything the Germans could do then. Were you ever scared for your life? That what? Were you ever scared for your life? Scared for my life? Yeah, the first very first mission. I told you that was the worst one. I'd never been on one before. I didn't know what what was going on, and I just followed the leader and. And uh, they told us it was going to be heavily uh, shot at, it was a heavily defended target. And the Germans were trying to pull two divisions out of southern Yugoslavia, and they needed these railroad tracks north. And uh, we were trying to knock out a bridge. But when you start your dive, you have to start at about you know, 10,000 10, feet or so. And the uh, time you got everything lined up, and the, the needle had to be in the center, and the ball had to be in the center and uh, that meant you were going absolutely straight. If either one was out that means you, you were going crooked so you had to be sure you was going straight and uh, we just lined up between our two 50 caliber machine guns and that was only sight we had on. There was actually no bomb sight on so I said it was not a good bomb and you build up speed awfully fast when you stick the nose down. That's why they hit compressibility. I've seen 550 on the thing <laughs> diving. <laughs> Anyway, you have to have room to pull out then, because when you go at that speed, it takes a while to pull her out because you put a terrific force on the wings of the airplane, and you can't do what you call a high-speed stall, pull them back too fast, because then you stress the plane too much, so that's when your head went down between your shoulders. <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> pull G-forces on your body. Okay, I have a form that I need you to um, sign okay. or fill out, and um, okay, this we need to fill out before we can put anything on the website, 
And this one, I need you to fill your name and then sign it. Spell my name and then sign it. Put your fill, fill your name out here, and then I need you to sign it. Okay, I'm going to have to do that in the kitchen. I'll like that right here. Okay. Chair. Okay. 